Let's start by talking a little bit about your background, what, what you've done and, and what you do now. Well, I bankrupted my first software company at 20 and then moved into my car. <laughs> <laughs> that was my start. <laughs> Real experience. Way to come out of the gate. Yeah, there was about six pounds of textbooks. I started my second software company from that car. It was called Systems Research and Development. I spent my life designing, architecting, and deploying software systems. I've done about 100 different systems over the years. I moved my company to Vegas in the early 90s, spent about a decade building systems for the casinos. That was pretty fun. I've kind of fallen in love with the old catch the bad guy mission in analytics. I uh, did a couple of rounds of venture capital. IBM bought my company January 2005. No one thought I would stay. It's been almost, it's been just over 10 years. Mm -hmm. I'm still having fun. Mm -hmm. And so we, the work that you're working on right now is centered around context computing. Is that correct? Yeah. Do you want me to explain what that is? I would love, it sounds, I would love that, yes. I picked the title myself, you yeah. know. <laughs> <laughs> but sometimes it's worthy of an explanation. Yes. If I reached into my pocket right now and handed you a puzzle piece and it had flames on it, and I said, is that good news or bad news? Mm. You'd, you'd be looking at it going, it's just, a, it's just a puzzle piece with flames on it. Right. You would need other pieces around it to find out if it's in a fireplace near a glass of wine or down the hallway near the kid's bedroom. Right. So context means better, or the definition that I'm using of context is this, to better understand something by taking into account the things around it. Mm -hmm. So context computing is taking a new piece of data that arrived in the enterprise as a puzzle piece and finding other pieces of data that has been previously seen and see how it fits. And then using, instead of using algorithms staring at puzzle pieces, you end up with whole chunks of the puzzle and it's much easier to make a high quality prediction. Right, and so you've been working on some software related to this called um, G2. Can you talk a little bit about what that software does and what your goals are? Yeah, so about maybe it was five or six years ago, another executive in IBM said to me, if you had a big idea, we'd fund it. And I thought to myself, if I could only build one more thing in my life, like one more, what would it be? And I pitched it, and they were kind of, my VC friends were a little upset. They're like, why did you quit and build it for us? <laughs> <laughs> but, but I pitched it, and, they, and um, IBM you know, leadership said, we'd like to invest in that. Let's build that. So the purpose of G2 is to be able to take structured and unstructured data, from batch or streaming sources. Think of it as, as new observations across a virtually unlimited number of data points. You could think of this as Internet of Things feeding it, mm -hmm. or transactional systems, or social data, or mobile data. And it's about weaving all of those puzzle pieces together, and then using the puzzle pieces as they land to figure out what's important or not. And you use these systems to help focus people's attention. So I have an example. My, the first project that I picked was to help the Singaporeans protect the Malacca Straits. Mm -hmm. Right on the uh, west side of Singapore uh, is this little waterway. Half the world's oil supply and a third of the world's commodities go through there. The kind of data they get, they get data about the crew, they get data about the vessels, like what kind of vessel and its length. They get ownership or pedigree of the vessel. Mm -hmm. They get movement data. A billion records just about how vessels move around the world. And they're trying to figure out at any given day what's the most interesting vessel that's right. worth their attention. Right. And so G2 takes the, all these data from these different sources. Some of it's coming in real time. Some of it's, you know, monthly, monthly files. And it's weaving it together. And in real time, in one of their command centers, at, at any given minute, second, it's like this is the most interesting thing. Hmm. And what is that achieving? Is are they looking for bad guys? There, you know, the 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 Malacca Strait waterway there is so important to the Singaporean. Um, country's um, survival it was mm -hmm. how they originally started launching their country. That any disruption there, if oh, one I ship see. bumped into another, sure. any kind of disruption there would, would have a negative effect to their uh, society sure. and economy. And that project led you then directly into outer space, correct? <laughs> <laughs> that did, it did lead me to outer space. <laughs> yes, as a matter of fact. <clears throat> what, you know, when we took the geospatial data from the vessels, uh, I created something called a space-time box. And I, when I say I, I mean, I kind of invented it, and then the team went right, off and built right. it for me, you know? And so we used space-time boxes to figure out when things were going to be near each other. And then after the project, my friends in Singapore and the government said, well, why don't you add X, Y, and Z? You don't need that for vessels because they're all just sitting on the surface of the Earth. Right. But why don't you add Z? And I'm like, why? And they go, planes. Right. And I'm like, wow, that's interesting. So my colleagues in IBM Research added Z. And then I'm thinking, well, how am I going to test this? Yeah. 
So I went to um, the University of Honolulu and hung out with the astronomers there at the Institute of Astronomy. And I started asking them questions about, you know, this business of asteroid hunting. And lo and behold, as they're telling me what the problems that they solve, we stumbled upon something and I said, wow, I've got this thing called a space-time box. Here's how, what we can do with it. And um, the long and short of that story is sometimes asteroids hit asteroids. Mm -hmm. Like there's 600,000 known asteroids, but none of them hit Earth. But now and then they hit each other. It's only been seen twice. Right. The first time, like in five years ago, the Hubble telescope just took a picture and in the middle of the telescope, in the middle of the picture is a giant X. It's because two asteroids hit each other. It was a total accident. Total accident. I mean, it was a after the fact. It was not predicted, you know, it just right. happened. So I asked them, well, why don't you compute if they, asteroids are going to hit each other? And they said, well, you silly fool. <laughs> That's multi-body orbit math, which means expensive, and it's an n-squared problem, which means, you know, 10 million computer hours. And I said, but if you use these space-time boxes, you could figure out if they're ever going to be near each other, and then only use the heavy compute if they're going to be near each other. Right. So we did a 25-year forecast, and now they're pointing the telescope at places in space and actually watching asteroids get close to each other. And have any of them hit yet? Or what is Not your Not that prediction? they've told me, but I, we've given them a forecast list, yeah. and um, they just, uh, a couple months ago, they sent me an email. It was in June, and um, the email said, this is unbelievable. It was the first time we've watched two asteroids. They got within the distance of Earth of each other out in the asteroid belt. Wow. It's never, and when you get that close to each other, they, because of gravity, you know, it can sure. change where they're going. Oh, and this is important for two reasons. One is Earth is where we keep our stuff. That's exactly <laughs> yeah. right. We yeah, don't that want is the first and second up. reason. <laughs> <laughs> so in a talk about this asteroid hunting, you mentioned uh, that geospatial data, you, you compare it to analytic superfood. Um, can you talk about where you see this geospatial data leading us and what applications <coughs> yeah. can you imagine? Well, this data that we leave about, well, where things leave, not just us, but our cars and Right. Boats. But let's use people. Okay. This detail about where we are and how we move is unbelievably powerful for prediction. And I'll, I'll give you an example. I have my credit card stolen roughly every year or two. It's great. It's just great. <laughs> it's rough. <laughs> it's just great. Yeah, somebody stole my credit card and used it in Las Vegas, where I live. Right. Eight months before anybody noticed. It's really embarrassing. <laughs> but the thing is, they weren't in my they weren't in my habit trail. You know, if, you, if, I, if we took your movement data about how you move, maybe not here while you're in New York, but right. from home to the office, it's very, very predictable. And if, you, if, if I were to let my bank see my location data and where I've moved, even if my phone was off or I left it at home, if I'm transacting somewhere in my habit trail, I would be able to approve that charge. And if there's transactions happening that are not near my phone and not in my habit trail, then you would maybe deny those charges. Right. So this geospatial data just fascinates me. I just think there's so much that can be computed with it. And what kind of issues do you see when we're talking, especially in the, in the context of people, privacy comes to mind. What sort of issues do you see and, and solutions to that? Well, I, I think the most interesting thing, but I'll first a survey question for you and, and anybody listening <laughs> is, when you got your free email, did you go read the terms of use? Oh, and always, yes, from beginning to Are end. Are you serious? No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I spend a lot of time with the privacy community. I sit on one advisory board. I sit on the board of another a privacy group. Uh, so I'm super interested in something called privacy by design. But it's an interesting question is when you ask people if they even looked at the terms of use and people say no, here's my prediction. The surveillance society is inevitable. It's irreversible. But the most interesting thing is it's irresistible, and you're doing it. Right. Organizations keep creating these irresistible services. So here's the general rule is you have to tell uh, your employees and your customers what data you're collecting and why, mm -hmm. and then use it for that purpose. Right. Yeah. But in this whole field of privacy by design, and one of my goals with this G2 project is I wanted to bake the privacy in before we even started. So I created, a, I took every privacy principle that I'd come up with in the prior years, and I've baked it into this thing, this new analytic this context computing thing called G2. Mm -hmm. And one of those features is called selective anonymization. Mm -hmm. And this is before you take the data out of your customer database and send it to some analytics, you can take the social security number and the driver's license and the address and the date of birth, and you can anonymize it and make it not reversible before you send it. And then you can still do the analytics on it and figure out who's the same as who and who's related to who. 
So this technique reduces the risk of un unintended disclosure. Right. Like if somebody goes and hacks that database, you actually haven't lost somebody's date of birth and social security number. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, it's interesting. There's quite a debate around the anonymization of, of data. So there, you know, there's the camp that it's impossible, and then there's the camp of no, it's not impossible. Where do you fall on that spectrum? To de-identify, there's two. There's first of all, my selective anonymization is about obfuscating features. Okay. It's like hiding an address or a phone. Right. But still being able to do compute on it. It's not about making you not identifiable. On each record that would be about you in one of these systems. Mm -hmm your date of birth and social security number would be non-human readable, but there'd be a pointer so it knows it's you as a customer, so they could transact with you as a customer. I see. So I'm not trying to hide identity, but another thing that's, that people are trying to do, different kind of technology, is de-identify data, mm -hmm. like sh strip it away so they can't determine it's you. Right, in medical situations. They and that is super them. hard. It was found in medical data. If you get rid of all this personal identifiers, but you keep a gender so you can do gender studies, you keep a date of birth so you can do age studies, and you right. keep a zip code for geospatial. With just a gender, a date of birth and a zip, 87.5% of the time, with comparing it to another data set, you can figure out who it is. Sure. Re-identification, which is, that's what this is. Right. De-identification and re-identification is super hard. Yeah. And if you want to make data not re-identifiable, the degree you make it not re-identifiable is the degree you make it useless. Mm. Interesting. So that's a, that's a tricky space. Yeah. I want to close our conversation today with a very personal, very general question. What people and projects are you following? What are you finding personally fascinating these days? I am fascinated with uh, people doing brain research in the area of the hippocampus. It's the part of the brain that processes patterns and gives you anticipation. It is the closest thing to what I'm building with G2. And I'll tell you, one of the things, just to give you a real specific example of what the hippocampus does is, because it helps you anticipate, when somebody's talking and they're saying all these words, you're, as they're talking, your brain is actually trying to compute what word you think they're going to say. Mm -hmm. The word next that I didn't just say, I actually just forced that word out yeah, of your yeah. little, out of your noodle, <laughs> and actually <laughs> not out of your noodle, into your noodle, out of the hippocampus. I just forced the word next. That's anticipation. And it's one of the things that I, I, I can see uh, my work growing up to do one of these days is to be able to provide that kind of anticipation. So hippocampus researchers I find really interesting. Uh, and of course astronomers I find interesting too because, you know, well, if we save Earth, you're That's gonna right. owe us. That's <laughs> right, save our stuff. Yeah, it's where we keep our stuff. All right, well thank you so much for talking with me today, Jeff. It's been a good time. All right, thanks.